So recently I reached out to Worfdale asking them if they can send me their new Evil Line series speaker for review. John at Worfdale happens to know my channel and he wrote back saying that, Thomas, you know what? I got a better idea. Let me send you the Elysium 4 speaker. I'm like, what? Elysium 4? I went online and checked it out and I'm like, oh my goodness, this is a $10,000 speaker. Needless to say, I was super hyped up for this. Rich, the local rep, delivered the speaker to my place. I needed his help to set up the speaker because these are like 50 kilograms each. So the first second when he took it out the box, I was like, uh, are you sure you didn't make a mistake? Are, are you sure those are $10,000? I don't know, man. Those look like $20,000 speakers to me. In fact, you know what? My wife uh, made a comment the other day. She said, Thomas, man, those speakers downstairs, they look expensive. You know, I've gone through 80 pairs of speakers here in my room. She never comments on my speakers. But between you and me, with the finishing it has, it can just make noise and it's worth 10 grand. So let's take a look at it today. So I'm going to quickly put up the specs here on screen. One thing that caught my attention, it has a sensitivity of 92 dB. Now granted this is a 4 ohm speaker, it is still very easy to drive. Even with my Cayenne CS55A, that's a 45 watt tube integrated amp, I had no problem driving these speakers. I want to take a moment to share with you my experience with different pairing with this speaker. When you pair with a $3,000 integrated amp, which I did, and a $20,000 plus setup, there is a significant performance difference. The speaker scales up really well. In my case, I got a chance to try it with the Lumen Power Amp as well as the Audio Research LS25. And I can tell, there is a difference when I compare it to my Macintosh 6700, when I compare it to the Cayenne CS55A and so forth. Now, Rich, who delivered the speakers to my place, he owns higher end speakers. And he told me he got a chance to A-B test them with really good front end gear. And he said, even compared to a $30,000 speaker, the gap is not that big. So my point is that if you can pair it with some seriously good front end gear, the speaker comes with an AMT tweeter, a six inch mid range and two 8.5 inch bass drivers rated from 30 Hertz and it goes up to 22 kilohertz. Now, as I mentioned, the finishing is incredible i'll try to show it in the video but it's going to be really hard now this is a port design speaker but it's a bit sophisticated the way they designed the port now i got a chance to speak to peter the designer of this speaker and he took the time to explain to me the design of this port now for those of you who have not seen the interview go check out the other video because if you do you will appreciate these speakers even more now, regarding how it sounds, I'm gonna quickly summarize it because I'll go into detail a bit later on. Now, the top end is smooth. The Elysium 4 is a smooth sounding speaker. For those of you who don't follow me, I usually break speaker down into analytical speakers and musical speakers. Well, there's some in between too. The Elysium 4 is a musical speaker for me. Usually I characterize musical speakers as a speaker with a bit of roll off on the top end. You're not assaulted with information. It's the kind of speaker where you able to just enjoy the music as opposed to analyze the music. You don't have that danger of getting listening fatigue with this speaker. This is the kind of speaker where you can just spend 12 hours listening to straight and you won't hurt your ears. Mid-range has a bit of texture to it and I would say a little bit of bite to it. Not that it's grainy, but it's not silky, buttery, smooth. When it comes to bass, this is where the Elysium 4 really shines. One of the complaints my, one of my uh, subscriber has, Tony, he owns these JBL speakers, L300. He said, man, these modern speakers, there's no bass to it. And he's, okay, I, I get it because I heard his system before. Now, you want bass, these speakers have it. The only speaker that I owned that can rival this speaker when it comes to bass, maybe the Sopra 2, it is very strong, chest pounding. It digs really deep. Some of you might be like, but it only goes down to 30 hertz. I have speakers here that are rated down to 22 hertz. 
well, with the help of DSP, not even close, man. It, it's no, no, just, just no. All right. When I say it digs deep, I mean it. When listening to cello, you can feel the cello's lower growls and intensity. So that's why I say specs really don't tell you everything, man. You really have to listen to these speakers to appreciate their bass. Now, not only is the bass strong, of course, it's very dynamic and it is relatively fast and it has very good definition. The soundstage is very big and I'll come back to that a bit later on. So the reason why I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about how it sounds is because everything I just used to describe the LSM4, I can use it to describe another speaker that's a thousand dollars, right? Good bass, strong bass, new one bass, uh, smooth top end, big whoop. The uh, Poke Audio LSIM707, I can use most of what I just said to describe that speaker. So rather, I'm going to spend time instead to share with you my experience and to let you know why you should consider this speaker and what to look for when you go audition this speaker. And before we continue in this video, I will be referencing my friend, Mr. Vintage. Um, he's somebody that plays with only vintage gear right now. That's why I call him Mr. Vintage. But he used to own a lot of high-end system, the kind of high-end system that's the price of a, almost the price of a house. So he has experience with high-end audio. Now, usually at this point, I talk about what's good and bad about the speaker. Now, the problem is that at $10,000, there are no bad speaker. It's really a question of taste. At $10,000, you do everything pretty okay. You have good stereo imaging, you have good soundstage, bass is good, detail is good. It's really a question of taste. Regardless, there are still a few things you should pay attention to, especially if you plan to buy the speaker blind. And I'm not kidding you, man. I get emails like that. Thomas, which $15,000 speaker I should buy? I can't test them because there's no dealers around me. I'm like, uh, yeah, okay. The best I can do is to give you a few things to think about. First, I need to listen it at a certain volume to appreciate it. Number two, I'm used to the V curve, boosted top end, boosted bass. So when I listen to this speaker, I needed to get used to it. And luckily, because I've gone through a lot of speakers, I recognize it. And for me, I'm like, okay, I just need to get used to it. So this is a, new, a relatively neutral sounding speaker. In the beginning, I thought it was a warm sounding speaker because of the strong bass. But as I listen more and more, I'm like, no, this is neutral, actually. So for some of you, it might be a little bit, quote unquote, boring. This is something that my friend, Mr. Vintage, told me a long time ago. The problem with a neutral system is that it can sound boring to some people because you don't have the exaggerated top end, exaggerated bass, but there are many advantages to it, which I'll cover a bit later on. That's number two. Number three, the mid range. As I mentioned, it's not buttery smooth. It's not silky smooth. Maybe because it's not, it doesn't have that V curve. The mid range does comes out a little bit more than what I'm used to. It is not forward sounding. It is not re, uh, laid back. It's not, not that. It's just that it's slightly different than what I'm used to. Now, the advantage of that, having a bit of texture in the mid-range, is that things sounds, quote-unquote, a bit more real. If you think about it, when you listen to a violin, it's not buttery smooth, it's not silky smooth. Listen to human voice, it's not silky smooth. So when I listen to it, it sounds, quote-unquote, a bit more real. I would say this, out of all the speakers I've tried, one thing that always bothers me is that at the end of a live performance, when I listen to a recording, the clapping of the crowd sounds fake to me. The Elysium 4 is one of the few speakers that I feel that's closer to what I hear in real life. Next, as I mentioned, the Elysium bass is really strong. Now, I hear this a lot in a lot of the high-end system that I listen to. Very strong bass. And for me, you need a room of a certain size to really maximize its potential. My room is 13 feet by 19 feet by I mean, 7.5 feet tall. Ideally, it would be great if I have a few more feet wider to really bring out the maximum potential of these speakers. Keep in mind, I do have bass trap in my room. It's fully treated, uh, even on the ceiling. So with that, it's okay. But ideally, you want it just a bit bigger than my room. And finally, as I mentioned, the Elysium 4 is really smooth sounding. So in my case, I actually had to remove some of my room treatment to listen to the speaker. Uh, for example, I took away my carpet. Um, I guess for most people, it's really not an issue because not 
a lot of people treat their room. But uh, in my case, because of my room treatment, I had to remove some of it because it's, I like sharpness. And for me, in a fully treated room, it was just a little bit too smooth for me. It's just a question of taste. When I say that I had to remove my carpet because I find it a little bit too smooth, for some of you, that's like you pay real money for that because it's great for long listening session. For the Elysium 4, it is possible to fine tune it to sound sharp. I did it with cables, silver cables, and I actually overdid it. I had to adjust it again because I made it too sharp. So as like all high-end gear that I've played with, it takes a bit of effort to make it sound good. Just don't expect plug and play. You need to put a bit of time and effort into matching your front-end gear to bring the very best out of it. So what do I like about the Elysium 4? Let's start with the fact that it disappears in my room. You're probably like, Thomas, big well, my bookshelf speaker disappears in my room. You see, I had a lot of speakers in my room that do disappear. No problem. The problem is the scale. These are big speaker. The sound stage it produces is enormous. And yet it disappears. This is rare. It doesn't ha I don't think I've tried another big speaker that can disappear like that in my room. That's number one. A lot of times when I listen to other speakers, because I can hear the tweeter. So at one point in the presentation, I feel like, yeah, I'm in the, the, the concert hall, for example. But the second I hear the tweeters, it takes me out of the concert hall and the soundstage suddenly is confined by the, the two tweeters. With the Elysium 4, you don't have that problem. The thing just, it's not there anymore. That's why with these speakers, I actually turn the legs off to listen to it. Because I like that it's able to create that illusion of this grand music hall, concert hall, whatever you call it, in front of me in my small room. Next, I like the fact that it's able to recreate certain instruments convincingly in my room. For example, grand piano, cello. Think about it, small bookshelf speaker, you want to recreate the illusion of a real cello in your room? Not gonna happen, man. You need something that's powerful and that's strong, that digs really deep, that can gently vibrate the floor. All those elements together, yeah, you need that. And these speakers can do it. And for those of you who don't know, I'm obsessed about wanting to recreate this cello, this grand piano in my room, because I heard it once at my friend's place. Now he owns a $300,000 system. And I was like, wow, that's how it sounds like when you're able to create the illusion of a grand piano in your room. You need power to do that. Next, it's detail. But it's not the kind of detail like my other speakers. For me, there are two types of detail. One is that where information is just fed to you, you don't need to put any effort into listening to information in the soundtrack. Now, the reason why I use the word information is because sometimes you hear the instrument, but you don't necessarily know what kind of instrument it is. So this is the part where I'm going to start telling a story about me and Quad 2905 and Mr. Vintage. Let's start with me playing the soundtrack for you. Now, for those of you who follow me, you're probably thinking, oh, Thomas is playing this soundtrack because he wants to talk about how fast these speakers are. Usually I play the soundtrack because I want to test the speed of the speaker. The drum notes should be very clearly defined. Bum, 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 bum. It should not be muddy. Now, in this case, no, it's not the reason why I play the soundtrack. The speed on these speakers are okay. They're not lightning fast, but they're fast enough. In the soundtrack I just played, what I was able to hear on the Elysium 4, I heard a squeaking noise produced by a closing door, and then I heard somebody yelling. And despite the fact that there are like drums playing, I was able to pick that up. You see, the other kind of detail that I, uh, that I like to talk about is that when you hear the instrument, you know what the instrument is. The Quad 2905, in the beginning, I hated it because it's not sharp, it doesn't sparkle. 
And one day, Mr. Vintage dropped by my place and he taught me how to listen to quad speakers. And we would play different tracks. And what I learned from that session was that when we play different tracks, when an instrument is playing somewhere faintly in the background, yes, you need to put a bit more effort to hear the instrument. But the second you pick out that instrument, you know what it is. Nobody's fighting for center stage, meaning that everybody is part of the performance. With other speakers that are very detailed, everybody's fighting for your attention. So think of it like you're going to eat a buffet. You have four dishes in front of you. The other speakers, the, the very detailed speakers, it's like somebody feeding you. While speakers like Quad are like, okay, there are four dishes. I am going to choose the dish I want to eat. And I can take my time to savor it. So when I listen to the Elysium 4, it has the same feel. I can hear all the instruments, okay? And I can lock onto one instrument and just listen to that one instrument. I'm not assaulted by the other instruments that take my attention away. Another way to put it is like this. And I learned this very early in my audio journey. If you have five instruments and they all play together, do, re, mi, all five different instruments play at the same time. If your system is not neutral, you might not be able to hear the different instruments. When you listen to them individually, the instrument is very clear, it's very you know, detailed, but when you have five at the same time, that's where you're not too sure you can hear the difference with a neutral sounding speaker. That's why Mr. Vintage is so obsessed fine tuning his system to be neutral. When you hear those five instruments, you can tell what the five instruments are. So although the Elysium 4 can quote unquote sound a little bit boring to some people because the lack of that V curve, if you understand this part, if you're, un if you're somebody who appreciate like orchestra music with a lot of things happening and you want to hear every single thing, then this speaker is more for you. All right, let's wrap it up at this point. Now, for those of you who don't follow me, I've mentioned this in my past video. The reason why I chase after high-end audio is because I don't want to just listen to the performance. I want to experience the performance. I want to have the illusion of a real cello in my room, a grand piano in my room. But not only that, with the Elysium 4, I feel like I'm transported to the location because I hear little things like the echo of the room, the reverb of the instrument, the people coughing next to me. Little things here and there add up together really creates that illusion. And most importantly, it's the fact that they disappear in my room. So that's why for me, the Elysium 4 is a speaker. If you're looking for a speaker around this price range, put it on your edition list, go check it out. So let me end this video by sharing this YouTube video that I really like. And at one point a few months ago, I used to actually listen to this video almost every night. And around two minutes something, you're going to hear people clapping gently as the musicians are playing. And with the Elysium 4, that part actually caught my attention. Now, once I mentioned to you, you're going to hear it. It's normal. But what shocked me is the fact that I've listened to this song every single night for a long time. And that part never caught my attention because every time when I listen to it, I'm so focused on the two performers that I never pay attention to what's happening behind. And with the Elysium 4, I start paying attention to all that. All right, so with that, uh, I'll end the video. The sound demo, hmm, there's really no point, but I'll still put it in the video because I know a lot of you will appreciate that. I'll also share the interview, one segment, where Peter talked about the bass port. For those of you who have not seen the other video on the interview, go check it out. All right, with that, I'll see you guys next time. And the bass, uh, as I mentioned, is very strong, right, with the speaker. Yeah, that's, that's due to the slot port. Um, so the, the slot port is, a, is my take on some work that Gilbert Briggs did um, back in the 50s. Mm -hmm. And I introduced it, uh, first of all, on the Diamond Ranger speakers. Um, to, because I wanted to get down the distortion that you often hear from, from a port. And I gradually improved it and improved it. And then I spent about two years developing the system for Elysium. And it's what we, what we now call the profile port. 
So if you look at the base of the speaker, there's a slot there. Um, the port is actually firing downwards into that slot and the slot is acting like a sort of mini horn. It's equalizing the high pressure in the port with the lower pressure in the room. That increases the port's efficiency and it also reduces the distortion. So you hear a clearer, cleaner bass. It, it's, very, it's a very tight bass for a ported loudspeaker, I think you'll agree. Yeah, 